Welcome everybody out there. We're live here in the pre-show for Southern Art Wider World, our third program in this National Endowment for the Humanities series. So while we're waiting, go ahead and give it a share. And, and uh, if you want to comment on where you're coming from or watching from, please do that. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight's episode. Got some good stuff in store for you. The, the theme is the Gulf in American Sea. Um, as we do, though, I'm going to bring in our collaborator here, Zaire Love, in a moment, and we're going to we're going to talk a bit about some of the things we've been thinking about before we bring on our distinguished guest, Jackie Davis, who's going to going to um, thrill us all with uh, the epic that is the Gulf. But uh, before we do that, me and Zaire, as we do, we're just going to kind of chat for a minute and. As y'all know, if you've tuned in before throughout the program, please do drop your comments and questions in there for us. And we'll, we'll pull, pull some of those out and, and tease out some of those answers. But Zaire, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing good. So, um, you know, we're going to talk tonight about a lot of things, you know, the Gulf as a body of water. But of course, it's more than that. It's got all this animal life in it. And Walter Anderson as a as a figure was all about connection to the wildlife um, and the landscapes. But when we were thinking about, you know, what are we going to chat about? We, we wanted to think about maybe um, animals and how close we've gotten to the wild or to an animal. So why don't you, uh, why don't you go and, and answer that question? What are your experiences getting close to wild beasts and animals? And, and uh, was it, what, did you feel safe or was it scary? Yeah, I felt pretty safe. Um, actually, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I, well, I took a few of my nieces and nephews to the safari uh, park here in Tennessee. I think it's in Alamo, Tennessee. And we got to, you know, feed these, you know, exotic animals like um, the ostrich and the camels and things of that sort. And it was it was super fun. Of course, like, it's, it's a new experience. These ostriches are like all in your car being super duper aggressive um, and things of that sort. Um, well, not aggressive. It's just like they're picking, they're doing their thing. And it's just like, um, wow, <laughs> this is crazy. But it was a beautiful thing to just be so, you know, connected and close to. And uh, I told you before, uh, we actually got to summon the giraffes, the giraffes. <laughs> Nobody was coming to their cars, but we like sang this song like giraffes, giraffes. <laughs> and, came and we, you know, we got to meet them. And that was something that my you really wanted to do. So I'm glad that nature heard our call and we were able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I've been to one of those safaris. It's like, you know, all these animals that aren't supposed to be here. But let's put them all here because as humans, we're, we're so separate from nature that we got to recreate a natural habitat for the animals to live in. So it's interesting. I remember when I was little, you know, we used to go in, in uh, you know, riverbeds and go out hiking and things. And we were in the water with the alligator gar one time, which are those prehistoric looking, um, you know, fish that have crocodile teeth and long bodies. And those are kind of freaky, but, you know. They're not going to bite you. Oh, wow. I've, I've never heard of that. Well, like I said, everybody out there, uh, Zaire and I, we've been warming it up for you. We're going to get into the program now and do drop your questions in while we uh, get a little closer to, to our special guest, our scholar, Jack E. Davis. So, Zaire, uh, we'll catch you on the flip side of this. And um, in the meantime, uh, let's uh, let's hit our let's cue our music and get into it. It all starts the southern part of the map The influence the globe ain't nothing harder than that We way smarter in fact in the stories that you heard about us Determination and birth the image we learn to progress It's all a process rebuild and regrow When the value's much more than the silver and gold See the stories passed down through the soil and the dirt And we rose from the ashes so we loyal to the earth And we royal from our birth See the beauty of the landscape Gulf Coast waters crashing on the sandbanks It's like a diamond but hitting in plain sight Gotta let the light shine, concealing it ain't right So I take my time, turn the page, make a line How I feel when I'm in the Mississippi state of mind When the cotton grows high, eh, the tide moves slow eh, The river belongs just to get us so home to me
So like I mentioned at the top, this is Southern Art Wider World. That was courtesy of Fifth Child and Zaire Love. A uh, little excerpt from Landmass, which is uh, our theme song for this program. So as I mentioned, tonight's program is called The Gulf in American Sea. And we'll learn as we go through this that the Gulf is more than just an expanse of water. It's a container and a mirror uh, for our expansive histories, both as a region, uh, but also as a country. So I'm um, a little bit overlooked in the national imagination, perhaps, but it's extremely important. And one of the things that's going to figure um, heavily in this in terms of Walter Anderson is the way he depicted the Gulf, but also the animals that he came in close contact with and the bird life specifically. So to, to get us kicked off in that vein, we're going to go as we do into the vault. Walter Anderson studied and painted birds throughout his lifetime. He even lived with pelicans on the Chandelier Islands for a time. And today we're going to take a look at some of his uh, paintings of birds and how we can really trace the evolution of the artist through these works. The first work that we're going to look at is of a kingfisher. And this is from the 1930s when Walter Anderson was actually working on a book of drawings and paintings of birds of the Gulf Coast. The work was done in the style of John James Audubon. It's very precise and it has a staged quality to it, but it lacks the vitality of the later works. So the second work that we're going to look at is a work from around the 1950s. Uh, this is of a juvenile green heron. And something that's very interesting about the work, especially in comparison to the kingfisher that we looked at previously, is that you see really the hurried brush strokes and almost this intimate uh, knowing between the artist and the creature that comes through the page. You can almost imagine him jumping around and Anderson hurriedly trying to depict this small bird. By the time that Walter Anderson was painting these later works, he had come to see himself as a part of nature. And he also saw the threats to the ecosystem that he loved. So Jack, can you hear me over there? I can hear you just fine. All right, check your mic, check your camera so we can see you, but we can we can kick it off in the meantime. Oh, um, oh gosh, while, that's while right. While you do that, I'm going to give give Jack Davis the the proper introduction that that he deserves. He's a professor of history and the Rothman Family Chair in Humanities at the University of Florida. His bio is chock full of interesting facts and and books. So I really do encourage you to to go find um, all of Jack's work um, on your own. It's too much to encapsulate in in um, in one fell swoop. But the the reason that we wanted to have Jack here tonight is that he authored a book called The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea, which won the Pulitzer Prize and um, really an amazing uh, work, an amazing accomplishment. So we're bringing Jack in now. And Jack, how are you doing? And why don't you tell us where you're coming from? I'm doing well. I'm in uh, Gainesville, Florida, my study at home. Um, it's uh, We had a rainstorm a little earlier, but now it's that, that post-storm brightness and um, when all the colors are brighter and the, and the you know, the, the sky has been literally washed. And uh, uh, so it, it's, it's a night, potentially a, a nice sunset. And if, if there is one, I'll see it right at my window here. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, you have a connection to Mississippi and you're, you're probably unique yeah. in, in terms of the scholars that we're bringing in for this program because you know more about Anderson than many of them do just because you've actually um, been inspired by him and, and written him into the books. But I wanted to start with another another visual artist and where you start when you introduce us to the Gulf, which is Winslow Homer. And so you're writing about Winslow Homer, of course, the American artist who is uh, renowned and, and famed for his work, especially along the Atlantic. But when he was fishing down here um, in the early 1900s, you know, he became kind of a foil for helping you get into the book. And I was wondering, you know, what about Winslow Homer, you know, made him so compelling? You, I think you did reference Homer's truth, this idea of a connection that linked humankind, nature and history. Um, but yeah, why, why visual artists as a way to understand something as big as the Gulf? Well, um, 
You know, in all of my books, artists and writers uh, figure into the narrative because I, because I think they are, and, and poets too, create, creative minds, we'll, we'll put it that way, because I think they offer, offer a, um, often, many of them do, uh, offer uh, a useful perspective that is outside the, the convention. And when you're writing a book and you're trying to say something, you want to write something new and something outside the convention. And maybe you found that uh, in... Winslow Holm or Walter Anderson or Eudora Welty or, or whomever. And it's, I think creative minds, to me, seem more in tune with the human condition, but also the environmental condition. And, and of course, that's certainly true with Walter Anderson. Uh, and I think they're just more in tune with the human and environmental condition than, than most of us. And they have something to show us that others don't. Now, as far as Winslow Homer, the, the, the subtitle of the book is The Making of an, an American Sea. I wanted my, my, my readers uh, to know that the, the Gulf of Mexico isn't just this regional sea. It's, it's truly an American sea. And all Americans, not just Gulf Siders, have a both ecological and historical connection to the sea. And so it made sense to me to open up the book with somebody who was not from the region. And um, Winslow Homer was from Maine. You can't get, it's hard to get any farther than that unless you go out west to California. And, um, but Winslow Homer had something to say about the Gulf of Mexico in his art. Uh, and I thought it was relevant to, very relevant to what I wanted to say uh, to, to my readers. And to me, it was a way of introducing the readers to this idea that the Gulf has connections beyond the region. Here's Winslow Homer from Maine. Um, and, uh, but it's also, I, I use Winslow Homer as a device uh, in this narrative, this opening narrative, uh, to explain um, what my vision of the, the, the Gulf was in, in, in its history, because that was conveyed to me through his art uh, and through his understanding of, of, of life. Yeah, and we'll talk more about Walter Anderson um, in the chapter on him, which is a great counterpoint to that. But, you know, Anderson famously wrote that, you know, art's incredible, not for itself, but in changing the artist's relation to other things, this idea of perspective. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a really important thing. And the perspective shifting quality of of the book, just the the project of writing this book was part of a long history of you know, whether they're the ocean biographies that you talk about where people would look closer and yeah. write these big tomes about the Mediterranean. And, but for some reason, the Gulf was oft overlooked. And even in Homer's art, you talked about how at some point the, 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 the native scenery ceased to be just the backdrop and became the focal point. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what about the Gulf's agency? I mean, what, what is that process of writing a biography about an ocean that's ever moving? Seems kind of like a hard thing to grasp, but a very important um, gap in that whole canon of, of biographies about uh, bodies of water that you were, you were filling. Yeah, I like that you used the, the, the term biography because that's how I, I see this work or how I saw what I was doing was writing a biography of, of, of a place. Uh, my previous my book before the Gulf book was a, was a biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And, um, but it, uh, the book wasn't just about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. It was also a biography of the Everglades. You can't tell Marjorie Stoneman Douglas' uh, biography without talking about the Everglades. And so when I, I finished that book and was looking around for a new one, I thought, well, Biography is nice. It comes pre. It becomes. Uh, it comes pre-organized, uh, but I couldn't find a historical human figure, uh, biographical human figure that I was interested in writing on, and uh, and it just occurred to me that, wait a minute, I've written a biography of a place, the Everglades. I can write a biography of another place, and that's of course the Gulf. It turned out to be the Gulf of Mexico. I grew up on the Gulf, and so I have this lifelong intimate relationship with it. And as, an, as both a biographer and a, an environmental historian, I believe that nature is this daily animating force in the lives of, of humans. It's this agent that shapes the course of human history. Although most historians uh, ignore nature as such. Uh, history for, nature for them is just a backdrop. You know, it's just, let's paint a little bit of a picture here, and then we'll move into the tedious human stuff. Um, and no offense to, to the... the non-environmental historians out there, but, but in any case, history 
for them is more human-centered. And I don't think life on Earth is as human-centered as we would like to think it is. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the Gulf of Mexico, as far as the Gulf of Mexico, on the matter of that, as a character um, or a shaping force, um, think how uh, our history, those of us who, who live on the Gulf Coast, who grew up on the Gulf Coast, how different our history would be if the Gulf didn't exist. Uh, and to say nothing about those who have lived away from the Gulf. Um, uh, and, you know, if it didn't exist as this estuarine-dominated dom estuarine sea that it is, how different would our climate be? How different would our economy be? How different would our stories and our art be? Uh, our, our, our art, A-R-R-T, -R -R -T, I don't know if that's coming through, but the art in your museum, <laughs> Would it, that museum even exist if not for the Gulf of Mexico? It would, if it did, it would be very different. Think of all the living things and all the images in your museum. Uh, if it didn't exist, those images wouldn't be there. Um, and so, and, and again, like any uh, historical agent, it reaches beyond the local. And, and the Gulf of Mexico certainly does uh, in, in, in many ways. And we can talk about that later, which I, I sense we will. Yeah, I mean, I did want to just allude to this idea that you talk about with the Gulf being analogous to the American West, which I thought was really compelling. Um, I mean, there is this idea, this frontier spirit that even if you're if you go out to Horn Island, uh, you, you do sort of feel like you're on another we're in another world. Maybe it's a it's yeah. the equivalent of a, a desert stretching out before you. But but even beyond that, you know, this idea of, you know, manifest destiny that so govern the West, um, there's this same this same tension and contestation that happened historically with, you know, indigenous societies and colonial and colonialism and, and all the industry that followed, it really is a, 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 a an American uh, lens. So just uh, without going too deep, I wanted to just mention that maybe, maybe you can address that and then delving into this also this other idea that you pose, which is to write a book that encompasses the Pleistocene to the present. I mean, the, the scale and scope and, and time yeah. that you're dealing with is just immense. You know, I just wonder, you know, talking about the, the idea that the Gulf is, is significant, not just for the region, but also that this book is not just about one moment in time, but all of time. It must really have changed the way you think about, you know, time, the mutability of time, how it can be both geologic and expansive, but then fleeting and personal. Yeah, let me let me address that question of manifest or the, the reference you made to manifest destiny first. Let me address that. Uh, I, I I see that manifest destiny um, uh, or, or it was drove not only Western expansion but but Southern expansion as well. It's going on at the same time, um, but for some reason historians have always looked west ra rather than south with regard to manifest destiny, um, and 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 I think that people overlooked the Gulf's contribution to the rise of, of the American economy and, 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 and culture, uh, whether it's related to manifest destiny or uh, in, in other ways. Uh, and they overlook its place in the history of, of American expansion, of continental expansion. Let me give you an example. Thomas Jefferson, who signed the, 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 the biggest um, real estate deal in American history, and uh, that, of course, was for the um, uh, Louisiana Purchase. And we, what we're taught in school is that Louisiana Purchase was all about Thomas Jefferson's desire for that land west of the Mississippi River that would double the size of the U U.S. Yes, he was very much interested in that. He was also hoping he'd find Mastodon bones out there, by the way. Uh, that's another story. Um, but, you know, he was equally as interested, if not more so, in the Mississippi River because the French controlled the Mississippi. They had New Orleans. And everybody, every European power that had any involvement in North America knew that whoever controlled the Mississippi controlled commerce in North America. Uh, and it was vitally important that the Americans get control of that river in, in New Orleans as well. Uh, and Jefferson, and uh, what Jefferson paid for all that territory west of the Mississippi River, he paid double for New Orleans. And he told every president, uh, that succeeded in him until he died. He said, you got to go for Cuba too, um, because Cuba's a gateway leading into the Gulf of Mexico. 
Uh, and not only whoever controlled the Mississippi River controlled the, the commerce on the American continent, the North American continent, they also, whoever controlled the Gulf controlled that commerce and controlled uh, access to, to, to that commerce. Um, and so I think that what happens with historians and, and, and just writers and people generally, just in looking at our history, looking at our geography, we're drawn more to uh, the terra firma, right? It has, mountains, it has things we can see. It has mountains, has forests, has gorges, has rivers and streams uh, and, and waterfalls and so much more. But a sea like the Gulf of Mexico, what do you see? You see the surface. Uh, it becomes one-dimensional, becomes an abstraction to, to some degree in, in people's minds. Um, they don't know what lies below the surface. Everything, virtually everything they see on the terra firma is duplicated below the surface, with the exception of trees, but there are other, there, there's a vast um, um, uh, you know, uh, diversity of, of plant life un, un, underneath the sea. Uh, and um, so we're not really, it's, it doesn't hit us the same way that terra firma does, that geology, that geography, and the history that occurs on, on the terra firma. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one thing I was thinking about when we were, you know, preparing for the program is that there, it's so easy or relatively easy to understand something that you can stand on, um, you know, the, the yeah. places where you can walk. But we're so unaccustomed and um, afraid, perhaps, of being in a sea. I mean, this we can't see sure. anything. It's why, yeah. it's why Jaws, Jaws was so successful, right? It's, I mean, it goes back to well, the DNA. Yeah, well, as I write in the book, it, was, it wasn't until the late 19th century but, that people really became interested in the beach because uh, the beach wasn't a place, it was a scary place. It was a place of storms and hurricanes. We'll leave it to the fishermen, you know. Uh, they all risk their lives. We're not going to go there. And so where did they go vacationing? They went vacationing to the interior parts of the United States. Florida's first the tourist attraction was not its beaches. It was its interior rivers and, and freshwater springs. And thousands of people in the 1870s, 50,000 people a year came from the Northeast and the Midwest, from the British Isles, to see Silver Springs right in the middle of, of, of Florida, not to come to the beaches. Eventually, they discover the beaches, and they say, oh, they're not so bad. They're actually pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, and but the, the other thing I should mention, and because I'm asked this question a lot, is why is... Why is our, um, the Gulf of Mexico overlooked by historians? They also ask the question about Florida, and I think that's largely because, um, <clears throat> you know, after, because the European, the first European power here was the, the, the Spanish, uh, and, um, and then the French, uh, and not later until, until the British. And uh, who started writing our history of America first? People from New England, so what do they focus on? They focus on Plymouth. Uh, you give them a little nudge, they go down to Jamestown. But they never come to Spanish Florida. You know, Florida has the, the oldest existing European city in North America. And I imagine a lot of people can't even identify it. Certainly not people from the Northeast, where I spend part of my, uh, part of my every, every year. Uh, Spanish uh, Western United States is, is overlooked or is not prioritized or, or given equal status as, as, the, uh, as the Anglo uh, origins of, of, of America. Yeah, well, I think the, to, to segue into our next segment, we're gonna get about a minute break for everybody to, to see a little vignette produced by, by Zaire Love, our resident uh, filmmaker. Right. But I think to, to segue into that is, you know, this idea of, um, you know, biocentrism versus you know, ethnocentrism too, and, and this idea that Anderson fills a, a good void for us. And, and I know he served as a bit of a cipher for you. So we're going to talk after, after this break um, a bit about uh, more about how Walter Anderson kind of gives us a little, a little bit of a bridge to, to see nature in a different way where we all couldn't see it like that ourselves. So Jack, we'll see you on the other side of this. And, and here's a little piece by Zaire Love. The first poetry is always written by sailors and farmers who sing with the wind in their teeth. The second poetry is written by scholars and students and wine drinkers who have learned to know a good thing.
third poetry is sometimes never written, but when it is, it is written by those who have brought nature and art into one thing. Whenever I think about Walter Anderson, and, and that was John Ruskey also depicted in their painting, he's almost performing a resurrection on these animals that he found on the beach. And I think that's an interesting metaphor to think about where these, these bodies of water that are almost part of another reality or even dead to us in our consciousness can, can you know, be brought back to life by artists. And you were telling me that Walter Anderson specifically was a way for you to, to, to get a foothold on this expansive story so what is the your history with Walter Anderson and, and how he figures into your, your book, The Gulf? Yeah, let me start by saying that he was he was absolutely integral to to this book. And it wouldn't be the same book without uh, Walter Anderson, um, truly. Um, and, I, and I say that with the utmost of sincerity and I'll explain why in just a minute. But um, I lived in Mississippi in the early 1990s and um, I co-wrote a back roads travel guide to Mississippi um, with Lorraine Red, who's uh, actually from, uh, 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 why am I forgetting, uh, Laurel, excuse me, uh, from Laurel, Mississippi. And uh, Lorraine and I traveled all over the state together to write this back roads travel guide. And, um, and that's when I was introduced to uh, Walter Anderson. And uh, I, th I found, I, I thought he was just fascinating from, from, uh, from, from the very start. And, uh, uh, and he always stuck with me. Uh, there was something about his spirit, something about his art, obviously, but also something about his spirit that I learned in reading some of his writings, uh, some of which were, 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 were just quoted in, uh, uh, during, during the break. And so many years later, and, uh, I don't know, I think I started on uh, the Gulf book in 2011 or 12, something like that. I wasn't sure how to write this history of the sea. I wasn't sure how to get into the book. And as an environmental historian, I was going to approach it somewhat differently from a conventional historian who might launch into the economic history or the social history, but I wasn't going to launch into the environmental history, but without ignoring the human relationship there with the, with the natural world, that's centrally important. That's what environmental historians study. And, uh, and then it occurred to me, I, Walter Anderson will show me how to write this book. So Walter Anderson is a central human character in chapter 12 of the book now, which is a, a chapter about barrier islands. Mm -hmm. and, and so I wrote that chapter first because I knew Walter would show me the way into this book. Uh, that his, I wanted his sensibilities, which are uh, similar to mine, to really be the, you know, shape the, um, the voice uh, 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 of the author myself. I wanted to shape the narrative, uh, the thrust, the whole thrust of the, of the book without being political. Walter Anderson wasn't political. You know, he had his, certainly had his opinions about humans and nature, but he wasn't this political animal. Uh, and, um, and so when I started writing chapter 12, Opening up with a uh, story of Walter Anderson uh, paddling or, or rowing, um, paddling or sailing out to Horn Island, um, it was, uh, he instantly showed me, you know, he navigated me, if you will, uh, into this book. Once I finished that chapter, it feels like that chapter, I can't even remember writing it, um, because it feels like that chapter wrote itself. Uh, once I finished that chapter, I knew I had, that this was the formula. This is how the rest of the book the other chapters should look, something like what I've written here. And so I'm forever grateful to, to him um, for, for showing me the way uh, into the story of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, another thing I was struck by, and Anderson has so many wonderful quotes, of course, but when he, when he is rowing out to Horn Island, he's you know, experiencing the Gulf as an, an entity, as a thing that has its own vitality. And yeah. he talks about being in conflict with a demon but to your point, which you talk about in the book, it's not a malevolent force. 
you know, Anderson talks about the sea being perfectly willing that he yeah, should, yeah. he should reach the Island, you know, but it takes that, that endurance and, and exertion that, that of course he was, he was so familiar with. Um, I was told by John Anderson, you know, Walter Anderson's son, who I know you visited with, but I've, I've been out to the Island several times and with John and, yeah, he once told me that, you know, Horn Island is like an hourglass. And the way I read what he was saying to me was that, you know, it keeps its own time, but it also keeps our time. It's, and it was what Anderson referred to as, you know, the back of Moby Dick, the white whale, which I know is another quote that you pulled from. Um, but that idea, you, you, you need someone who has a cosmic view of things to kind of explain that to you. But I, I wondered to you, you have the gulf. And so in, in, in many ways, the gulf is this large entity that's hard to grasp. But the islands, you can at least get a foothold. You know, they may not be the terra firma that we're accustomed to, but they are places we can stand on. And um, in terms of the island, you know, they they, they contain all this history, um, even if they're catching the histories of our our uh, our failures to maybe protect it. Um, you know, this is a power wheels jeep I came across on the island. So there's there's these stories that are colliding, but it also tells us about the you know, the indigenous histories and the industrial histories, you know, what do you think about the, the role of, you know, the islands? What, what are so unique about the barrier islands and what stories do they tell? Well, if you look at a map of the Gulf of Mexico, if you look at an aerial map or a satellite map of the Gulf of Mexico, you'll see that it's fronted um, uh, by barrier islands from, from, from Florida to Texas on, on down into Mexico, of course. And, um, and many of them are, are very, very close together. And there are few places, there no, there's no other coast in the, in the United States that has such a high concentration of barrier islands. And, um, and the, these barrier islands tell a geological, and, and, but also an ecological story, and they tell a human story, of course. And again, going back to that earlier rhetorical prompt, imagine what the Gulf would be like without these barrier islands. We would not have our estuarine environments, uh, for example. They cordon in uh, the freshwater, I mean the, the salt water and the freshwater that comes from, from, from the rivers, which is, and that's kind of an elixir or a mix that estuarine environments need. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, along with those estuarine environments are the livelihoods uh, that, uh, of so many people that are connected to those estuaries, which is something we, t we tend to forget when we, we destroy these, those estuaries. And we're destroying jobs, we're destroying livelihoods. Um, and in those islands, the other thing about the islands is they don't have local origins. They are products of the geography of the wider region and beyond. Um, if, and uh, uh, that the sand that builds those islands doesn't come up from the Gulf or it doesn't originate from the Gulf floor. It originates, at least in my part of the Gulf of Mexico, the Appalachian Mountains. Over on the, um, the western part of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, sediment from as far away as the, the Rocky Mountains washes down, uh, and builds the beaches, and builds those islands. And I, as I write in the book, when you, walk on a, when you walk on a beach, particularly if you walk on a beach on a barrier island, you're walking on a mountain. Uh, and um, so they're products of the geography uh, from faraway places. And if they didn't exist, more than likely the rivers that run to the Gulf would not exist either. Um, um, because without those rivers, we wouldn't have that sediment washing down to the Gulf. Uh, and if those barrier islands didn't exist, we would, not, we would know a very different Walter Anderson, wouldn't we? Um, uh, if we were to even know him at all. Yeah. I mean, you wrote again, t taking on this, this idea that, um, you know, Anderson had this rhythm of the sea in him and the history of Horn Island is fascinating. We don't need to delve too deep in, into all of it, but, um, you know, obviously you've, you've got this geologic history you described and the fact that sand that is moving westward, again, this idea of westward movement is very American, even if in this case it's completely yeah. geological, yeah, yeah. Um, but that the, the sand that replenishes it, that comes from the east and the islands are slowly moving westward. Uh, but then, of course, if we dredge a, a ship channel that depletes an island of its of its eastward um, you know, momentum of the sand from, from that side. And then also you, you, if you look at the, the French coming here, you know, 
famously in Ocean Springs, it's uh, Diaberville in 1699. But a few years later, you know, his brother Bienville, as we as we think about him, obviously they had other names, but the the title Bienville, who became the, the you know the founder of New Orleans, he was the first owner of Horn Island. That he received it from the crown. And I think what one thing you write about, which is interesting, is that um, in in that point in history, these explorers and historians didn't see any real value in the islands. And so I wanted to, to juxtapose that with the estuarine life that you talk about, this gumbo of life that that sustained the societies that, that were here before, um, you know, colonial powers came and, and made it their own. Can you expound just a bit about, you know, this this idea that the geology of, of a place then run smack dab into the humanity of it and, and how many fractured histories and interesting um, anecdotes you know, spin off from that. And if you want to, you can also, I know you've been to Horn Island. So maybe, maybe when you were on Horn Island, I wonder if any of those, those ideas and histories became more personal to you. Yeah. Every, everything I wrote about the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico became, became personal to me. As I mentioned earlier, I, I, I grew up on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, so I thought I knew it, but I realized how much I, I did not really, really know it. And what's really heartwarming to me is when people come up to me who have also grown up on the Gulf and have read the book said, my gosh, I didn't know any of this, or I learned so much about this place that I love. Uh, and, um, and so it, it's a deep, long history. Uh, it goes back eight, eight human history, um, a ge geological history aside. And if we go back eight, 10,000 years ago, that's when the first humans arrived in, in, in the region. And um, some of those indigenous groups, um, many of them, uh, most of them were actually hunter-gatherers, but they divided their time between living on the coast and living inland uh, and traveling around and following the game, um, and, but also gathering uh, nuts and berries and, 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 and other plants. But there were groups that lived on the, on, on the Gulf side uh, without, who were not nomadic and they weren't agrarian either. And that's highly unusual uh, to have a, a non-nomadic, a sedentary people or culture who were not, uh, 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 you know, farmers were not agrarian. Um, but they didn't need to be because those estuarine environments were so rich uh, in, in food and, and virtually everything they needed. Uh, and when the Europeans arrived, um, they were stunned by all of these, these shell mounds around the Gulf of Mexico. And these, of course, built by discarded shells and, and fish bones and, and so forth, which is evidence of how uh, uh, biologically wealthy the, the Gulf of Mexico was, uh, not just before the European came, came but even as uh, they, they arrived. But as far as Europeans and, and Americans in those those barrier islands, I mean, you think about, we've talked about Western expansion, we've talked about mass, manifest destiny. Those islands are really the trailing end of migration, right? They are the last things that we quote unquote conquer when we move to the Gulf, when we build those bridges, those causeways that connect the mainland to those barrier islands. So much so, and then built up on those barrier islands, so much so that many of us will be on these barrier islands driving down a four-lane highway and not even know we're on a barrier island. Uh, we think we're still on the mainland. Um, that's how much we've disguised many of these, um, these natural features, which is unfortunate. But we've benefited from them when we haven't built out on them um, because they're natural buffers against the in intense weather. Uh, and uh, but of course, in building out on them, we're putting ourselves in harm, harm's way. And then when a hurricane comes along, what do we call that hurricane? A natural disaster. It's really a human-made disaster because we put ourselves out there, and and, and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't, you know, we we made mistakes, and I, but I also think we've learned a lot from our relationship with the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. It's, yeah, that, that, that's uh, the fact that humans, you know, we have more agency. We, we think we have all the agency. And then when it comes yeah. time for us to maybe abdicate from some responsibility, maybe we are, we are <laughs> yeah. under exactly. our agency. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. You have a lot of books behind you, but we do have a comment here. Um, sure. you know, if you've read John Cuevas's books on Cat Island, just down the way from Horn, and whether you have or haven't, I just wonder, 
um, you know, we, we are so familiar with Horn Island, of course, but that wasn't the only one that, that Anderson frequented. Um, but what do you see, you know, as, as you go across the coast, I don't want to leave out anybody from, from Florida to Texas. Is there anything, you know, that, um, you know, the character of these islands that, that they are, that they share, or is, is perhaps do some of these islands stand alone in your, um, in your kind of imagination of the Gulf? Well, I mean, the, the one thing that they share is that they are, you know, they're sand spits, you know, they're, they're completely sand. I mean, that's their terra firma. Uh, they're impermanent. As you mentioned earlier, they migrate, uh, they shrink, they grow, uh, they move about, uh, which, is a, which is a fascinating fascinating thing to think about. And I love writing about that and how, how, how they move. Um, and, but they're, you know, you know, the thing about these barrier islands and, 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 me, and my studying them is one thing that I, I, I wouldn't say I learned is, but I started conceiving them and, and talking about them in a different way. To me, there's no such thing as a deserted island. To Walter Anderson, there was no such thing as a deserted island, whether it was Cat Island, whether it was Horn Island, whether it was the Chandeliers, um, um, uh, where, whether it was Mullet Key over on, on, on my coast, uh, and, uh, or, 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 of course, some of the, the wonderful barrier islands along the, the Texas coast. Uh, and they're not... They're not deserted. And I hate that expression. And I correct my students. I correct my writer friends when they use that term. Because Walter knew there was so much life out there on those islands. And we see one. It looks like it might be an osprey nest. Um, is that potentially uh, yep. a bald eagle nest uh, in, in that pine tree? And uh, it's probably an osprey nest, uh, mm -hmm. judging by the, by, by the bird, shape of the bird. And there's just all kinds of all kinds of activity out there. They are just bustling places. And to suggest they're deserted is, is a horrific idea to me. It, you know, denies nature uh, and its place uh, in uh, both on Earth, but also with, with, within our lives. That's great. Well, that's another good segue. And I just want to tag another thing um, that you wrote about, which is to say Anderson was no Robinson Crusoe. You know, we, yeah. we think about it. And Anderson loved Western canon. You know, he loved literature and I'm yeah. sure was fascinated with, with anything about an island. But the idea that you would occupy an island and then build atop it was completely antithetical to, to what Anderson uh, believed. And even when he went out there and found the dregs of the U.S. Army's occupation during World War II, yeah, yeah. he quick, quickly moved away from, from that settlement and decided instead that sleeping underneath his boat was, was a better way to go. But um, we're going to take another break. And when we, when we come back after this, this next vignette, as we call them, produced by Zaire Love, we're going to talk a bit about the bird life. Uh, you mentioned the osprey. We're going to talk a little bit more about pelicans and eagles and, and more about the American imagination. After you have lived on the island for a while, there comes a time when you realize that the pelican holds everything for you. It has the song of the thrush, the form and understanding of man, the tenderness and gentleness of the dove, the mystery and dynamic quality of the nightjar, and the potential qualities of all life. In a word, you lose your heart to it. It becomes your child and the hope and the future of the world depend upon it. Walter Anderson's favorite bird was the pelican. He wrote about them often, and in his writings spoke about them as beautiful and majestic beings. Today I had a delightful time while I did paint. It was an embarrassment of riches while I was painting pelicans. Anderson wasn't the only one who saw birds as magical and praiseworthy. The Tunica tribe also have a reverence for birds, and more specifically, the eagle. The origin story goes that the Tunica chief was tired of other natives eating his people. So he called the other chief to a fight. The other chief agreed. They fought with hickory sticks until they killed each other. The Tunica people burned their bodies and was later told by an old wise man that this would be a good thing in four days. After four days, the Tunica people came back and saw that the two chiefs were transforming into eagles. Still ready to fight, the Tunica chief said, If we fight like that again, we shall fight up above in the sky. Each flew into the sky, one going north and the other south. They met in the middle of the sky and fought each other with hickory sticks. The Tunica chief defeated the other 
and can still be heard whooping in the air as he passes in the dawn of the new year. So that's a, a great introduction to um, to birds, you know, recentering us on this one slice of, of biodiversity. Of course, there's many more animals that tell us things and then teach us things. But Anderson, uh, you know, and the eagle and the pelican and the osprey and all the rest are, are, are messengers uh, of a sort to us. And, uh, you know, I love that. I love Anderson's quotes about pelicans. He also had a belief that they were the perfect combination of beauty, grace and awkwardness which I thought was a good, uh, a good thing to consider as, as he was also talking about them as people, because we're all, all a little bit awkward. Um, but what do you think, you know, you, you talk about Anderson again, as um, when he's painting and thinking that the animals are the heroic figures in his work. And I wonder, we talked about how the islands are teaching us things, but then uh, when we kind of move a little closer and zoom in on the animals, what are these heroic figures perhaps telling us about you know, the threats to the Gulf and in some cases, the resilience. Well, resilience is it, you know, it's uh, 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 first and foremost, uh, persistence, resilience. I mean, uh, these creatures have been around a long before um, uh, humans uh, and they'll be here um, long after us. And there's, there's, there's no question about that. I'm writing a book about the bald eagle now, as you know, and um, persistence is a central theme in the story of, of, of the bald eagle, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, but um, they, uh, they, they are, particularly those that you name, the osprey, the pelican, and the bald eagle, they are uh, apex um, uh, species in, in their environments. And, and in that of course, means they're also indicator species. So if they're suffering, that means the environment's suffering. Um, the ecology that they depend on is, is suffering. And if that ecology, if that environment's suffering, we're suffering too, because we share that environment. We drink the same water, we breathe the same air, we eat the same fish. You know, we fish in the same places as, as those, those birds do. Um, and hey, let me tell you something. They're much better fishers than we are. Uh, particularly the osprey, uh, which is a phenomenal fisher. Uh, and, and, but, you know, they add very much to, I, I think, if we, you know, as humans, we look at things from a, a, an aesthetic perspective off, often, right? You know, who doesn't love to look at a snow-capped mountain uh, or a deep green valley or the Grand Canyon? You know, birds certainly add to that aesthetic. Um, they're charming, they're beautiful. Um, they're impressive, um, and uh, and of course anybody who knows the Gulf of Mexico knows the the, the, the brown pelican, um, as you mentioned, Walter Anderson's favorite bird. I absolutely love writing about the brown pelican in in the Gulf of Mexico. I had the greatest time because people would call, um, uh, you know, in the 18th and 19th century on to the 20th century. People refer to the pelican as ugly. Um, it, obviously, nobody, none of these people called the pelican ugly saw Walter Anderson painting, thank you for putting that up, painting of, 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 ball, of, uh, of pelicans. I think they're stunning creatures. Um, they're fascinating to watch. Um, as they are soaring, as they're gliding inches above the water at sunset, you know, um, what, a, you know what a most astonishing uh, you know, a view or, 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 or treat to see. Uh, and in uh, and, and osprey, as I mentioned, they are expert fishers. Osprey, when they go fishing, uh, they succeed more than 70% of the time catching their fish. Now, ask any baseball player, would you like to be a 70% hitter? Hell yeah! But they'll settle for 30%, right? And they're still, you know, they're still going to make the Hall of Fame. Um, but these, these Osprey are phenomenal. And that's one reason why the bald eagle um, is, um, is a pest to the Osprey. Because the, uh, the bald eagle is only that 350 ba uh, 
uh, you know, batter, you know, and they, they only succeed about 35, maybe 40 percent of the time. So the bald eagles are smart. People think they're stupid, think they're robbers. They call them thieves. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, because they steal from the ospreys, they force the osprey to drop their fish. And some people who are tuned in now may have witnessed this. Uh, they'll catch that fish in midair before it ca uh, hits the water often. Um, and, um, but the bald eagle knows the osprey is a better fisher, so why not go after um, the, the better fisher? Uh, and, the, and of course, the osprey, poor osprey, has to turn around and go out and catch another fish and hope that an eagle doesn't go after it the second time. Um, but there, I mean, just, you just can't imagine, as I write in the book, the pelican, the brown pelican, disappeared from part of the Gulf Coast. Uh, in the mid-1960s, of all places, Louisiana. And what state around the Gulf of Mexico do we most associate the pelican with? Louisiana. It's disappeared for a couple of years. Uh, and from parts of Mississippi and, and western part of, of, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico because of DDT. The bald eagle disappeared as well, unfortunately, because of, the, of DDT. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the Gulf, I didn't see a bald eagle, I think, until the 1990s. I was an adult by then. Um, and uh, I didn't even know they lived on the Gulf Coast, um, but they do. They're, they're, the, the estuarine environments are, are um, a, a favored uh, feeding ground for, for, for bald eagles. Um, and so again, going back to that idea, when, you know, the bird life has come back since I was a kid, from, since the 1970s, uh, and, and, you know, just they're, it's thriving now. Um, the the bird po the uh, bird population around the Gulf of Mexico the wading birds the fishing birds the seabirds that's because we cleaned up those estuarine environments that we brought to the edge of ruin around the Gulf of Mexico primarily with raw sewage but also with industrial waste and we clean that up and those estuarine environments have come back to thriving life and what do they bring they brought the bird they brought the, the marine life the seagrasses which brings the marine life and the marine life brings what brings those pelicans, it brings those osprey, uh, brings the bald eagles, and all the other fishing birds, the egrets and the herons as, as, as well. Uh, and we're fortunate to have that, that thriving Gulf environment again, uh, when we almost lost it like we almost lost the bald eagle in the 1960s. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't realize it's fascinating, the, the math at work. I love the, the tool of of baseball as a way to understand this, but you know, the reason the Osprey has to be such a good hitter is because the Eagle is going to steal, you know, steal this base. That's the, the metaphor didn't quite hold up there, but you get the point. And I think the um, you know, <laughs> Anderson, it works for me. Uh, there you go. So a Anderson was also fascinated with, with drawing the bird's eye view. So he obviously wanted to put himself in that position. And when I was on Horn Island uh, last year, we canoed out there as people who know the museum uh, will be, uh, reminded of is that we canoed out to Horn Island camp for a week. But when we were out there, you know, I was, you know, kind of stalking some of those pictures I, that we looked at earlier of the Osprey nest, you know, I was stalking the, the Osprey because it was such a fascinating uh, scene. Um, but then I, you know, I realized and was reminded by our guide um, who's a, a wilderness guide named John Rusky that, you know, I was probably getting a little too close and, you know, he, he asked me, you imagine how the Osprey feels, you know, what, what is it from the Osprey's perspective? And, uh, I felt a little guilty. And then later when we were canoeing along the Gulf side, the outside beach of the island, we canoed the whole 10 miles. And and that's where I did see an osprey and an eagle fighting for a fish in the sky and pelicans diving all around. And um, I never knew as a Mississippian that bald eagles lived in Mississippi. Um, it's really right, right. something that Anderson would, would be proud for us to know because he wanted folks to look closer at their own surroundings and realize the beauty and and transformation at work um, all the time. I wonder if you could, because you are an environmental historian, um, if you could just tell us a bit more about DDT, um, just exactly what was happening. Because, you know, I um, you know, I, I wanted to bring in this Rachel Carson quote because it it again gets to that apolitical idea of why we should care about this. You know, that the consequences of of these things and DDT, of course, being the the culprit in in the cases of the pelicans and the eagles during the 50s and 60s, you know, this is not just something that uh, people who want to watch these birds uh, or study them should care about, but anybody, any any average person, any duck hunter, anyone who who likes the sight of these majestic creatures, 
Um, so can you just set us straight about, you know, and I guess the ducks too um, would, would be a um, kind of a, a species that was um, hard hit by this pesticide, but, but what was happening? And then the, by extension, you know, if you, if you say that we've, we've to some degree fixed it, and I know legislation was a role in that, you know, what can these animals tell us about, or what conclusions can we draw about our responsibility moving forward? Because certainly if we've messed it up once, we can do it again. Yeah. Um, so as far as, uh, let me just mention the osprey real quickly here. Um, one reason why, another reason why it's such a good fisher is because that's the only thing it eats is fish. Um, and whereas the bald eagle will feed from the table, the air, land, and sea. Um, and, but, it, it, but it does prefer fish. And as far as DDT, so DDT was introduced um, into the commercial market right after World War uh, II uh, because it's shown great success during World War during the war to control typhus and other diseases. It was really phenomenal um, what, it, what it did to save um, uh, the lives of, uh, of the uh, allies. And um, because before World War II, most lives were lost in war, were lost to disease more so than uh, to combat. And, the, uh, and so it seemed like this, this miracle chemical, right? Uh, and so it was introduced into the larger uh, commercial market in 19, August, uh, August, September, 1945. And the, but immediately there are scientists who recognize that, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, this is not such a miracle chemical that you think it is. Uh, it, it, there are some issues here. It's killing wildlife and it's, it's getting into the human body. As early as 1946, there are all these warnings um, uh, but they are ignored. And so DDT is, um, uh, makes this big splash on the commercial market. It's used everywhere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to control. We move from beating the, the Nazis and the fascists to now we're going to beat the bugs. You know, we're going to, we're going, if, you know, we're going to take over this insect world. We're going to show them where they belong, and that's not with, with humans. Um, and so it was used everywhere, uh, in agriculture, in the home, in schools, in parks, and playgrounds, you, you name it. Um, and unfortunately, it had a profound impact on, on wildlife. Um, what happens is when DDT gets into the body of, of certain species, it breaks down, and it atomizes into an, uh, another chemical, DDE. And DDE uh, is the chemical that uh, affects the, um, the development of eggs in, in many birds, the osprey, uh, raptors in, in particular, uh, the, 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 and fish-eating birds such as osprey uh, and, um, and, and, and bald eagles. And of course DDT, because it was sprayed so heavily uh, in agricultural areas, but again, parks and playgrounds too, it ends up in the water stream uh, and, uh, and entering into those environments where there are marine life that the birds eat. So the birds consume the fish um, that, is, that it contains DDT and it gets into the body of the birds um, and then it makes its way as DDT uh, into uh, uh, into the egg gland of, of birds, and they're laying these mushy eggs or weak-shelled eggs that either never hatch or if they hatch, the, um, uh, the hatchlings are so deformed uh, uh, that they don't live for, for a very long time. So what happens is the falcon population, the, the uh, osprey population, the bald eagle population, and so many other bird populations, the, the condor population, the California condor population uh, are devastated uh, by this. But once we ban um, DDT, thanks to the EPA and the Nixon administration in the early 1970s, ban its, its sale in the U.S. in 1972, we start to see an instant change within um, the, the, you know, in the bird world. Uh, and they, they're starting to come back. And we, of course, uh, we're also helping many of them along with egg trans, uh, translocation, it's called, with um, uh, uh, baby bird hacking, moving 
uh, baby birds out of the nest of healthy areas into places like in Mississippi. Mississippi had one bald eagle um, nesting pair in the early 1960s, by the way, uh, when there were only 473, I think it was, bald eagle nesting pairs in the United States in 1963, the lower U.S., um, but also with these, these various programs, federally funded programs uh, run by the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, um, we started bringing these bird populations um, back to life. And the, the success of their, uh, of their uh, revival uh, exceeded everybody's, even the scientists working uh, in um, a restoration uh, exceeded everybody's expectations. Uh, the osprey, uh, the falcon, the, the, the bald eagle. 2007, the bald eagle was taken off the endangered species list because its comeback has been so successful. For a couple of reasons, not just the Endangered Species Act, uh, the Clean Water Act, vitally important to cleaning up those estuarine environments. And that's exactly what happened. Clean Water Act in 1972. That's exactly what happened around the Gulf of Mexico. So as a consequence, we have a five plus billion dollar recreational uh, uh, fishing industry in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Five billion dollars. We have a 200, uh, no, excuse me, 22 billion dollar or more commercial fishing industry around the Gulf of Mexico. We wouldn't have those if those estuarine environments had not come back to life. We have a multi billion dollar birding or bird watching industry on the Gulf of Mexico too. Uh, that's a lot of money being pumped into the local economy because we cleaned up the environment. Everybody pitched in. It wasn't just federal laws. It was, it was conservationists. It was businesses. It was local uh, state and, 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 and national elected officials. It was policymakers. Uh, everybody pitched in because they recognize that nobody benefits from dirty water. Wow, yeah, I mean, I think the, the value, when we talk about what is what is valuable, and that, that's a, a Central American question that goes, that runs yeah. through all of our history, but to preserve things as wilderness is, is one way to look at that, that's a valuable thing, but um, not only economic, but just cultural, you know, the value of these of these animals in these places are, cannot be um, misunderstood or over overstated. And pulling in a, an, another, uh, comment and, and hear from from the audience talking about how many birds rely on the gulf and you know obviously you know we're talking about several of them that call it home but there are also many more that call it home and many more that use use uh, the migratory routes to um you know to, as part of their um their lives so i want to zoom out a bit and as we kind of go towards the close of the program i do want to hear uh sort of the, the the idea of the book that's coming uh, bird of paradox so this 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 idea of the eagle, which we of course d doesn't have to be said, you know what it means to America as a symbol, um, but I think it, it's a good way to circle back to the Gulf being important to America, the fact that you're writing a book about this bird being so important to America. So um, aside from the history that you just told us, that's one one I'm sure important narrative thread. Why did you decide to focus on the eagle? Maybe what's the thesis um, of the book? Well, the thesis of the book is, well, well let me, the, the, the focus of the book is, um, the bald eagle, first of all, let me say, is, is endemic to North America. It lives nowhere else in the world. Uh, so it's a very special bird for, 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 for us. And it, um, and, and the book is a natural and cultural history of the bald eagle from pre-Columbian period, its relationship with native peoples, uh, to the present, focusing on um, the U.S. or the American relationship with, with, with the bald eagle. Uh, again, sir, not uh, without um, um, considering the, the, the native relationship with bald eagles. That's, that's a through line throughout this history, by the way, um, and a very interesting one, particularly in the, in, in the 21st century. And I, and I chose the title Bird of Paradox because, unfortunately, the bald eagle, which, by the way, is not the national bird. We have no national bird. Uh, and we have a national tree, we have, which is the oak. We have an, uh, a national flower, which is rose. And we have a natural mammal, which is, which is the bison. But we don't have an, a national um, a bird. But the bald eagle certainly is a national symbol because it was adopted, adopted for the Great Seal of the United States in 1782. 
And the Great Seal went through various incarnations um, uh, with, with various proposals up until 1782, and not until the Ball of Eagles showed up. Um, did Congress say, yes, that's it. That's what we want. But the interesting thing is, here is the bird of America throughout the 19th century. Unfortunately, Americans are blowing it out of the sky left and right. It has this bad reputa reputation uh, as, a, as a thief, uh, as a scavenger, uh, as a dishonest bird, as many people called it, including Ben Franklin, uh, a coward, uh, the bald eagle was always called. Um, and while we revere the symbol, we were murdering the species. Uh, and um, so it's a story of that, that paradox in, in part. But again, what we end up, it's a, it's a wonderful story in the end. Um, it's really a love story in the end because by the late 20th century, we fall back in love with the bald eagle and we save it from extinction. And that's what the language was. Oh my God, it's going to go extinct in the lower 48 states if we don't do something. Uh, and it was. In many states, it was gone uh, completely. And it, and it lived in every state in the U.S. at one point. Uh, and, uh, and so it's this great uh, American um, uh, uh, conservation success story um, it, as well. And the bald eagle and our relationship with it, and the subtitle of the book at this point is How the Bald Eagle Saved the Soul of America, is what I mentioned earlier. It shows us what we do well and do wrong in our relationship with, with the natural world. Um, and, and I, you know, how can we ignore that? Uh, how can we ignore that gift from a species like, like, like the bald eagle? Uh, because then, again, that natural world is our world. We've, we've, you know, we fouled our own nest. The bald eagle didn't foul it. We fouled our own nest, but we've also cleaned it up. That's great. I mean, I think I'm going to bring um, Zaire back in, and and um, I love that idea, of paradox and love. I think we can we can maybe leave with those two things if people are watching. Those are both things to to keep in mind. You know, I wanted to to leave you all with, with this, as a final thought, and and I want to hear if Zaire has anything to to add, but. You know, Michael McCarthy, who's another journalist and, and conservationist, I just wanted to read this quote uh, to the audience and to y'all, and maybe we can just uh, leave that as the, the, the final um, kind of chit on the table to, to weigh in on. And he's saying how the, the core perception, this is a paraphrase, but the core perception of evolutionary psychology is that, you know, during the 50,000 generations that preceded us, and this goes back to the Pleistocene, you know, this, this uh, you know, the, the same scale that you're using for the book in terms of time we during that 50,000 generations we became what we are as part of nature and that's you know we were wildlife he says we don't think of ourselves as wildlife anymore but we were wildlife then and then, the, then that generation all those generations were so important to our psyches and that's juxtaposed against the 500 only 500 generations of civilization that have followed this invention of farming michael mccarthy says so there's a legacy deep within us a legacy of instinct legacy of inherited feelings, which may lie very deep in the tissues. It may lie underneath all the parts of civilization, which we are so familiar with on a daily basis, but it is not gone. We might've left the natural world, most of us, but the natural world has not left us. So um, I'm gonna give Jack the final word, but Zaire, you were listening to all that and, and that quote, and, and I'm sure hearing Jack talk about so many different things, anything you wanna to, to to throw into the comments and, and um, the conversation here to um, to add to it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I just wanted to see, Jack, I, I know the uh, Native tribe origin stories are new to me. I, I just learned about it, of the yeah. animals, how they yeah. how they reference or reference, you know, birds, specifically the yeah. eagle. And I wanted to see like how that has impacted your research, your writing, or even your imagination, you know, as you um, have studied these birds and specifically the eagle. Yeah, it, it has. I mean, when I compare the native relationship with the, um, the, the American relationship with the bald eagle, it's significantly different. Uh, I mean, the native relationship, natives did hunt eagles, but they hunt, hunted them for spiritual reasons, but they also recognize that uh, what they would take from the wild would be very limited and would not affect the sustainability of the eagle populations. That's not true with with Americans. But historically, traditionally, we have not thought in terms of 
sustainability. That's really a recent recent concept. Uh, and and of course, the Native peoples, the the bald eagle was a, a, a spiritual. Uh, not all Native groups, but because there are you know thousands of them across North America. But for many of them, the bald eagle was a, was a spirit bird. It communicated um, uh, with with the, with the higher powers and in dead ancestors as as well. And um, and in factors as as you the wonderful uh, origin story that you shared with us uh, this evening, it factored into the origin story of of many native peoples uh, uh, across North America. Uh, I think that um, there's something we can learn from their relationship, um, not just simply with the, with the bald eagle, um, but with wildlife and the natural world generally. Uh, the Native Americans could be harsh at times on, on certain, in certain environments, but they didn't bring, as far as we know, they didn't bring any species to the edge of extinction, much less uh, were they responsible for the extinction of any species unlike ourselves. Um, which is not to say, I'm not trying to criticize this, I'm not trying to point the finger at us. It's a historical fact. Uh, but we've recognized, you know, um, our misadventures of, of, of the past, if you, if you will. And we've, we've done, uh, I think, a, a, a back, um, uh, well, I forgot the term I was just looking for, um, we, we've done a good job. We should congratulate ourselves for, for um, moving so far over the course of time away from those misadventures. Uh, we owe ourselves a pat on the back, which is the expression I was looking for, of all expressions. And uh, so, um, and I, I have to go on and on and on, on uh, to talk about how our relationship, the American relationship with the bald eagle has altered or force alterations within native relationships, but it's 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 been significant. Um, but uh, but again, I think there's a lot for us to there. There's a model uh, for us. So um, Jack, I'm gonna make you feel good just just to say that there's a, a few people saying how much they love the book, or um, others that that they've uh, book ordered. So that that'd be good for the publisher to know. And then another that's saying, you know, I know the Eagle book's coming, but when's this Brown Pelican book gonna gonna come? So maybe we'll <laughs> we'll see that someday soon. Um, another another uh, bit of praise for the book. So I'm gonna tee you up just for the last word here, um, just to say, what is if you had to tell your your children or um, anybody else who's a young person one thing. No, no, one child, one child, yeah, one child. But what one thing about what they um, what they should do to to maybe start to peel back the onion as you've done about what the environment means? Oh, I think they already are. You know, I you know I've been teaching for uh, college for twenty six years, something like that, um, and so I've gone from believe it or not, baby boomers to now to you know Gen X to. Um, millennials to Gen Z's. The millennials and the Gen Z's get it. And oh my gosh, that just gives me so much hope for the future of, um, of, of the world environment and for, for the Gulf environment. Um, and my advice to them is, hey, just forge ahead. Uh, they recognize that we have not left, this, left them with a great environmental legacy. Um, and they want to change things. And so um, my, my advice to them is more power to you. Uh, go for it um, because you've got the right message. Um, I really think it's shaped um, the narrative that's going on now in the presidential um, uh, campaign, uh, and or at least on one side. And, uh, and, it's, and it's affected what's happening in, in, in Washington. And some great things have, have come out lately. Um, so I want to say thank you to the millennials and, and to the Gen Zs. Beautiful. Well, we all have um, have our part to play in our generation and, and to yeah. leave it oh, to yeah. the next. <clears throat> to leave it to the next. So I think that's that's what this is all about. If we're thinking about time, and we've been talking about time from the very beginning, 
And now that we're running out of time, I think the last thing to say is you all have to kind of seize the moment that you're in and certainly go explore while you have, uh, you know, the ability to do so, but also make sure you're, you know, you're leaving a legacy um, that, that is sustainable behind. So Jack, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to release you and sign off. We really have enjoyed having you. It's been a, a pleasure. Um, I know you mean so much to the people here on, on the Gulf Coast and definitely in Ocean Springs and the museum family. So we look forward to seeing you in person soon and, and y'all stay safe and well over there in Florida. Thank you, you too. And I can't wait to get back up on the Mississippi coast again. Excellent. Bye-bye. Bye. So with that, another program is in the books and um, we will be joining you again soon. So keep uh, keep tuned into our website. This was the third of seven programs as part of Southern Art Wider World. Thanks again to our supporters and sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, also supported by the Mississippi Humanities Council and in partnership with the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. Uh, with that, we'll sign off. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Play show.